All right, here we go. Today we have lawyer Drew Findling, a.k.a. the Billion Dollar Lawyer, who most recently represented YFN Lucci in his RICO case, as well as representing Boosie, Cardi B, Lil Baby, Shaq, Dennis Rodman, Gucci Mane, the Baby, Migos, and even Donald Trump in the past. Welcome to Vlad TV. Glad to be here, Vlad. Well, you know, it's a pleasure to actually sit down with one of the, the big lawyers in Atlanta who's represented a lot of people that I actually know personally and I've interviewed. Uh, but I want to start with your whole story. So you grew up in Long Island. I did. Okay. And did you know you wanted to be a lawyer early on? No, no idea. First lawyer I ever met in my life, Vlad, was the first law professor that walked in in my first class. Uh, I was a criminal law professor, walked in, and that was the first lawyer I ever met. Okay. And from there on in, you decided you're going to become a lawyer? Yeah. You know, I was already in law school. Um, I was uh, kind of aimlessly in law school. I come from uh, very humble beginnings, raised by a single mom, my sister and I. I didn't have any idea what a lawyer did, uh, but it just seemed like something to do after college. I uh, went to a really good law school. Still can't believe they accepted me. And went to a civil firm. I was in the civil firm for about six months. Uh, was bored to death, uh, was thinking of jumping out the window, but we were on the second floor. So with my luck, I would have just broken a hip. So I decided to look for better work, read an article about uh, the new public defender of Fulton County and uh, called him up at 9 a.m. the next day, that Monday. And I was the first guy he ever interviewed, became a public defender, and then the rest is history. Okay, so you became a, a Fulton County public defender. Yes. Right after you, you, know, you finished the Georgia Bar. Yes, virtually within months, it was with a civil firm, hated it, um, and went to the public defender's office and realized that I had a passion um, for doing criminal defense work. But most importantly, Vlad, I, I, you know, back in the day, you could try cases almost immediately. Two of my kids um, are our public defenders. One of them now is not, he's with our firm, but it's more difficult to get on trial these days right away. There's, there's a lot of oversight. Um, back then, man, it was wild west, you know, you were out of law school and you were trying to murder cases within a couple of months. And so I fell in love with the, the excitement and the adrenaline rush. And the, of course, the whole process of representing another human being. And that was it. I was hooked for life. Well, a lot of people hear horror stories about public defenders. You know, you always say, you know, get a real lawyer, not a public defender, because the public defender is in bed with the judge and they're just trying to get the cases off their desk and they're not going to try very hard and you'll go to jail with a public defender. You've always heard this. And, yeah, I you think, know, so I, I think that's uh, bullshit. In fact, there's video out there you can find of me years ago, um, you know, during the, the pandemic, right? We were kind of sitting around with nothing to do. So I was just yapping. Um, I believe that the realest lawyers, I always say, are public defenders. Um, I always say as a, in private practice, if you really know what you're doing, and sadly in my profession, you know, it's, it's I, I say all the time, uh, there's a lot of people playing pickup ball right now at a basketball court, but you know, one millionth of one percent become NBA players. Well, unfortunately in my profession, anybody could be a trial lawyer. So your odds are greater having a great trial lawyer at the public defender's office than you are some dude that's just trying to make their car payment and pay their rent. Uh, so I think generally speaking, the larger percentage of great trial lawyers are at the public defender's office. Hmm. Okay. And you were the first, you know, attorney in the country that actually presented a case for battered women's syndrome based on only verbal abuse. Yeah, great research. You're absolutely right. It was really life-changing for me, Vlad. Uh, I, when I, you know, I was one of these people, it's very different now. Most people, you know, don't, um, they don't go to law school right out of school. Like my son, you know, they get business experience. He was in commercial real estate and then they do it. It was a little different for me. Um, you know, I, I got out of college and, you know, all of a sudden I'm, 25 years old, I'm trying murder cases. I was really fortunate. Um, I, I got on a real roll at 25 years old and I was banging out trials and winning cases one after the other. So I was getting bigger and bigger cases and starting to generate uh, publicity in my mid twenties. And then I got appointed a case uh, that I felt I can use the better woman syndrome, but there was no evidence that the guy had ever hit the woman before. And so I decided to go out on the limb and say, well, verbal threats, or can be just as egregious and just as scary as being hit, put the defense up. Uh, her name was Doris Jean Norman, um, walked her. She was found not guilty. And I, I, I kind of got national publicity before I knew it. You know, I'd barely been on maybe two or three plane flights my whole life at that point. 
I was getting flown around the country, giving speeches to lawyers 20 years older than me. National publications were writing about me. And so that chain of events uh, really changed things for me. Interesting. So you could be a, a battered woman or a battered man just because someone verbally has abused you and never actually put a hand on you? So that's a defense we put up and, uh, you know, it took the jury a couple of days, but they came back not guilty. And then after that, uh, as in anything in life, right? You know, if, if somebody finds out you're you know, a dentist that's great at putting in veneers, everybody calls you, right? Um, if you're a great heart surgeon, everybody calls you. All of a sudden, I started getting these phone calls and I was getting calls from around the country. And so I left the public defender's office and went into private practice and just started picking up a lot of these cases. And so there was at one point, I was clearly representing more women charged with murder than anybody in the United States and disproportionately winning more than anybody in America. Um, and I, I got phone calls from coast to coast. Okay, so that woman beat a murder case because yeah. she was verbally abused yes. by her boyfriend or yeah. husband? Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Interesting. When you look at, for example, the Jonathan Majors case and how he was found guilty over, there's some verbal abuse in there. You know, there's some physical abuse, but it seems like it was mostly him trying to fight her off. And ultimately the charges were very, very low. But obviously the penalty for someone like him was massive. He lost his Marvel deal. You know, being that you have this type of background with battered women and so forth, how do you feel about that case? Well, so I'm so, uh, I'm literally so busy. Um, it's hard for me to keep up with uh, other folks' cases. Um, so I definitely try, you know, not to Monday morning quarterback because really I don't know what's in the, what we call the discovery. Like I have no idea what was really in the case. Um, but I'm always interested in, in these other cases. Uh, and I would really have to do a, a deep dive. Uh, but I always get concerned about lengthy sentencing. Obviously, if you do your research on me, I'm, I'm really not a big jail person. I think this country disproportionately puts people, particularly uh, people and even more specifically men of color in jail um, for ridiculous reasons for ridiculously long periods of time. So uh, on that level, it's th something like that bothers me, but I guess we'll see what ultimately happens to him. Got it. Okay, so you end up leaving the public defender's office. You went private. By 2018, you were named the president of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Yeah. That's a, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, yeah, that was... Um, uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting, because uh, Vlad, I know about your, um, your deep connections to the music industry, and particularly um, the, the hip-hop industry. And as you know, and I still can't figure out how... Um, I'm so uh, connected to all these uh, women and men that I, I love so, so dearly. Um, but there's really a connection, if you don't mind me saying, to that presidency in that. Uh, when I did, I had always been involved as all criminal defense lawyers should in the country. We, you know, that's almost like our unofficial union, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. They're one of the most powerful bar associations in America, and they speak for the criminal defense bar. And I was always involved. Uh, but never thought I had really the time to try to ascend to something like the presidency, which is incredibly um, uh, busy and it re requires a lot of travel. Um, but when I did the South Georgia Migos case, um, I was really disheartened um, by the way that this, these, these guys, these three young men um, of color and all the people that were with them were treated down there. And I mean, I had, I had to find 15, 16 lawyers to represent everybody involved. I felt the case was replete with racism. And I thought to myself during that, that nine month ordeal, you know, we can have a huge budget. I, we can have the best lawyers in the South, if not America involved. And still these guys are getting hammered by racist law enforcement. Um, if that's gonna happen to them, then what's gonna happen um, to the poorest of the poor in, in Alabama, in Mississippi, in Arkansas, in Oklahoma. And the only way that I felt that I can deal with it is to try to, on a national level, um, get involved. So that really was the catalyst for me to want to aspire to be the president of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Okay. And I remember the Hollywood Reporter actually did an article and you were named as one of Hollywood's top 20 troubleshooters. <laughs> yep. Okay, and your clients are pretty extensive. Cardi B, Migos, like you mentioned, Gucci Mane, uh, The Baby, Waka Flocka, Lil Baby, Dennis Rodman, Shaquille O'Neal, and our biggest regular guest, Boosie. My guy. 
Okay, so let's talk about some of these cases here. So Cardi B, what'd you end up doing with her? Yeah, so uh, before COVID started, uh, Cardi had this uh, nightclub case uh, in Queens. And um, she already had lawyers working on the case. Uh, as you know, uh, her husband, I've known him since he's a teenager, I'm incredibly close with him. And obviously um, all three of the Migos, including Takeoff, may he rest in peace, and their families. And, and so when Cardi became part of uh, Offset's world, then uh, at some point, even though she had other representation in New York, um, they reached out to me and asked me to jump on board. And I worked on that case um, for, for years. Uh, obviously, like a bunch of cases around America, it got slowed down by, by COVID. But on the, on the cusp of trial, literally um, the Thursday before trial, I mean, we had 600 jurors scheduled to come in. Um, we received a resolution that was uh, more than satisfactory to Cardi to continue um, her career. And the rest is history. Okay, that's where the girl got beat up in the, the Queens nightclub and Cardi got charged for that? Yeah, she and a couple other people got charged, yeah. Okay, and ultimately she what, got probation? Yeah, and it was uh, almost instantaneously kind of suspended um, upon the speeches that she gave to the community. Got it. Okay, uh, Gucci Mane, what'd you do with him? Uh, so uh, I, met, I met Gucci Mane, uh, and it's funny, so, uh, you know, a little nuance about me is uh, I, I really call everybody by their civilian names. And for some reason, everybody that I represent prefers that. It's just been a, a habit of mine from the beginning. So I always think of him as Raydrick. Like if I called him up and said Gucci, he would think it was the wrong number. Um, but Gucci came to me in the Harlem Knights case. And uh, it was the hitting a, a, a soldier um, that was, you know, uh, just in civilian clothes at a nightclub one night, getting into dispute. And he got referred to me. He And uh, I represented him in that case. And while I was representing him, he picked up the federal gun case, uh, possession of firearm by a convicted felon, um, and uh, represented him in that. And so I kind of jointly handled all those. And there was a lot going on for him. And so what we did is eventually I had to globally resolve all of his cases uh, because he had these essentially three things going on at once. He had the Fulton County Harlem Knights case, the federal gun case, and that gun case took place in a county that had the option charging him. I had a close up shop, resolve that case, convince everybody um, that this was an anomaly, um, was able to do that and then go back to the judge and, and, and kind of show the judge that he was entitled to get about five or six months back. And so, as you recall, we got him him out early on that. And um, it's one of the most satisfying things in my career because uh, Gucci's just been on fire ever since. I mean, I think it's fair to say um, that since we got him out early, his career has been, you know, a hundred times bigger and better than it ever was beforehand. And I use him as an example to so many of my clients, how you can use the worst experience of your life to make it essentially the best experience of your life. Oh, yeah. I mean, Gucci, before he went to prison, was a madman. <laughs> and now people think he's a clone. <laughs> you know, he's such a different Gucci. I mean, you're right. Yeah. You know, so the, the thing about so, you know, m my opinion about this, uh, this profession, and, and I know you're so intimately familiar with so many folks, is uh, I get the one thing that pisses me off was when, uh, you know, like, for example, as you know, we'll talk about it, I'm sure at some point I spent, you know, two and a half weeks interviewing 115 potential jurors in YFN. And I see the way that the prosecution and law enforcement look at people in hip hop or rap um, and, and the community does. And I look at it really different because as opposed to everybody else, I, I'm sitting face to face with them all the time. And I think the, the profession is filled with people with incredible brilliance. I can't finish Roses Are Red, you know, Violets Are, and then I just freeze up. Um, but these women and men can go on for six minutes freestyling and, and actually be thematic about it. And, and people, if they pay attention, they're not just shooing out profanity, but they're talking about life experiences. So I have an inc incredible um, appreciation for their brilliance. And Gucci is, is really uh, a standard of that. I mean, most people wouldn't know that, um, that he voraciously reads. 
Most people haven't been in a conversation with him and know that he has a better vocabulary than 99% of the lawyers that I'll see in court next week. Um, he's a brilliant guy. And as many people know, when he got out of serving that time, and uh, in, I think it was in Terre Haute, Indiana, I'll never forget, I took my son, um, who's now an attorney at my office, Zach with me, we went to visit him at this house he had rented. And up on the wall, he had all the lyrics that he had spent three years writing. And I'm like, this guy is fucking brilliant. It, it's amazing. And so, you know, it's, it's a real attribute to him and to me generally to the industry. Now, what about the baby who actually calls you a mentor? So the baby or the little baby? Because yeah. no, I the got the baby. whole nursery school, man. No, you got, you got all the babies. We'll get yeah. to the little baby after. Let's talk yeah. about the baby uh, first. Look, uh, I, I, I love the baby. Um, and, uh, you know, he is another guy. I, I have an expression that uh, I feel like uh, grinders um, are attracted to one another in friendship and respect. Uh, I, you know, if there's one thing I'll say, I don't, I don't like to do the whole self-talk about myself, um, but I do work hard. Um, I, do, I do believe in grinding. I think when you're fighting for somebody's freedom and their liberty, you owe them 24 seven and don't bitch about it and talk about, you know, work-life balance and all that bullshit. My clients aren't worried about my fucking work-life balance. They're worried about freedom. And um, DeBaby is that guy in his industry. This guy is a relentless worker. He never stops working. Every time he calls me, he's you know FaceTiming me and he's in the middle of another project. Um, but he's another guy that's so smart. Um, as you know, because I, you know, I, I know in all your interviews um, how well-researched you are. As you know, in, in December of um, 22, I did a civil uh, federal trial for him and we won defense verdict. This guy, Jonathan Kirk, John Kirk, the baby, was so laser focused during that trial. I mean, I, I've represented executives in white collar cases that are not as, have not been as laser focused than him. And he really studied the process. It was funny during one of the depositions, he's being deposed and we're about three hours in and he objects. And I'm like, did the baby just fucking object? And, and then he literally says, you didn't lay the foundation. Literally, this is what he says. I'm like, you got freaking people that are 20 years out of law school that don't understand foundation. But John Kirk, the baby, picks up on things so quickly. Um, I have great admiration for his uh, laser beam focus and intelligence. What was that case over? So that was um, him uh, in a dispute uh, pre, pre Super Bowl. Um, this January 2020, um, uh, with some promoters that were, you know, trying to, from his perspective, take advantage of him. Um, and they try to sue him. And of course we countersued and, um, he got a defense verdict. Um, there was a physical dispute and we shut him out, shut out ball, man. We threw a no hitter. We went Nolan Ryan on him. Okay. So what about little baby? What was that case about? So Lil Baby's kind of different. He was, um, uh, I know he, he was on a, another similar show to yours and he had a great quote that I told him I wanted to put on coffee mugs. He called me my lawyer. That's not my lawyer because I don't get in trouble. Uh, Lil Baby really doesn't have any issues. Um, but I met Lil Baby when he first started. And so if you uh, go on my Instagram account, uh, you'll see a picture of him wearing some royal blue sweatshirt you know, in 2018 or whatever it is. And um, I met him right when he started. And so Lil Baby um, is just a guy that's come around. He's real dedicated to the community. He's become a real friend of the office. Um, he stops by all the time. Just saw him at a Hawks game I was with Boosie at. Um, and it's really become a friend of the office. And what's cool about him is, as you know, he served, you know, he served a couple of years in jail. And so I convinced Lil Baby um, to get involved in uh, criminal justice reform. And I've had Lil Baby give two national speeches. So, I mean, I, I want you to think about this. This is a Lil Baby um, that's performing to sold, sold out audiences with 14,000 people. Um, but I had him speak to lawyers, even prosecutors and judges from all over the country um, in, in, one, in one event uh, about prisoner reentry issues and the collateral consequences of being a convicted felon. And then I had him as a feature speech speaker in another event. Uh, and he held his own, man. 
He was as good as any of the lawyers that were on the uh, on the card. OK, so you just mentioned Boosie. This is, you know, our biggest regular guest and me and him go back almost 20 years. What exactly were you representing him for? So so. Uh, Boosie had, you know, long before I knew Boosie, um, uh, he had his big case in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and he was represented by my good friend, uh, Jason Williams. And uh, as many people know, Jason has gone on into the world of politics. And he and, and it's crazy because uh, he's now the district attorney for the Orleans Parish. Uh, and he still has incredible love for Boosie. So I say to people all the time, OK, when you think of Boosie, understand that the district attorney in one of the major cities in this country loves Boosie as much as a bunch of us do. Um, but he had a, he had an issue outside a case outside of Atlanta that I took care of. Then right after COVID, he had another case. Um, and he's he's kind of another guy, Vlad, that's just become uh, a friend of the office. I think what Boosie would tell you, the unique part of our practice, we always say, you know, once you're our client, you're kind of our 365, 24 seven friend, you need us, you stop by anytime. Um, he's become really close with my son who's at the office. They say they always see each other at the mall, which tells me Boosie shopping, but also tells me my kids at the mall all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, he's just a friend of the office. And uh, he's another guy that the other people in the industry, and I know you hear this, people in his industry have incredible respect for his business acumen. I'm not a transactional guy, Vlad, at all. I don't do that. I'm not going to negotiate your contract. I don't want to. When I buy a house, I don't even read the fucking mortgage papers, okay? Um, but I'm talking some of the highest, most successful, highest level people in the industry will tell me, Boosie is a, is a business savant. Um, and I have incredible respect um, for intelligence. And I think that's just amazing. Uh, but a lot of people on the outside are going to, you know, just stereotype and just see him be kind of funny and think, oh, he's just a goofy guy. No, if you're thinking he's goofy, number one, he's not goofy. He's smarter than you. And he makes a thousand times more money than the people that are laughing at him. Oh, yeah. No, me and Boosie, our business relationship goes back, you know, over a decade. And it's always professional, always on time. There's never any, you know, if we agree to do something, he'll do it to his full capacity. He won't try to leave early or try to cut corners. It's always 100% with him every single time. Whenever there's any sort of miscommunication or whatever, we get on the phone, we work it out, and five minutes later, we're done. So it's funny you say that. So uh, Zach, my, my son, Zach and I, Zach Finling and I, we're meeting him at a basketball game just two days ago. And he sends me a text going, I need you to be on time. And I say, Zach, he's the only fucking rapper in the world that just told me I need to be on time. Um, so you're exactly right. He, if he says he'll be there at 10, he's there at 9.55. Okay, so speaking of basketball, you actually represented a couple of basketball players. Shaquille O'Neal, what were we doing with him? Yeah, so Shaq had a, 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 a kind of domestic related civil type of thing uh, years ago. And he had a great lawyer out of Vegas um, that was helping him out, good friend of mine. And um, we felt that he was being, uh, he was the victim of a shakedown, which unfortunately, when you're famous and have a lot of money, shakedown is just part of the business. And so brought me in and um, we took care of business for him because we are shakedown detectors. Uh, and we, we got to represent Shaq. Uh, guy was cool as can be, super respectful uh, client. Um, he's the kind of guy that gets on the phone and does all the research on you before he puts you on your team. Um, so very impressive guy. Okay, and finally, Dennis Rodman. So there was a, uh, a an investigation and a prosecution here in what's was known as the Gold Club case, and the Gold Club was a famous strip club uh, where it was uh, alleged in this you know this conspiracy that they were ripping off customers. Uh, it was alleged to be tied to a criminal organization, and so while people were kind of shopping for lawyers. Um, I got approached um, by some LA folks that wanted to send me Dennis Rodman. And I'm like, okay, why would I want any client in, the, in a strip club case when I can represent Dennis Rodman and hang out with him? And uh, it, it, again, an amazing, when I kind of reflect back in my career, an amazing experience. Another guy that's smart as a whip, another guy that reads the paper front to the back and talk to you about any subject. 
And Vlad, I love to tell this story. He and I are working and we're going through things and we're at the Ritz Carlton, we're talking and he puts ESPN on and we kind of talk, then we take a break. And what shocked me is that he starts talking about the NHL. I can't hold a conversation about the NHL. And I'm like, wow, Dennis Rodman is schooling me on the NHL. Um, But just a super intelligent guy uh, that I experienced was a workout fiend. Because when I went to meet him the next day, security told me this guy was freaking working out, lifting like two in the morning, nonstop. Well, not every case works out and not every client works out. Have you ever had any bad experiences where you took a client on and it just didn't work out and you've had to either leave or they've ended up, you know, getting a different lawyer? Yeah, I mean, you know, that 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 definitely happens from um, from time to time. Um, I always like to be on on my terms. Uh, you know, generally speaking, um, I demand respect for my office. We're a little bit different. Um, if you talk to criminal defense lawyers, uh, you'll probably, I mean, some big firms say that they do criminal defense, but they don't try cases. Um, we try cases. Uh, and, and so a little different is that we're five lawyers dedicated to, to this profession. And I expect everybody in my office, if we're going to treat people with respect. But if I detect that you're not going to be respectful to us, then we're out. There are too many people that are that are calling our phone, like come by the office one day and you'll have to put those um, earphones on because the phone's ringing off the hook all the time. So if you're going to be disrespectful, then it's just not going to work out with us. Can you name anyone that was disrespectful? No, not really, because we have great luck with clients. We, we okay. you know, pretty passionate about what we do. I mean, if I caught a murder case and I wanted you to represent me, how much would it cost me? Well, I can't ballpark. give it any... yeah. just a ballpark. Yeah, I, I'm never going to do that. You're not going to catch me doing that. But um, I would say a lot of fucking money. I mean, I mean, in terms of a retainer, how much of a retainer I need to give you to just kind of get the ball rolling? It, 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 there's no getting the ball rolling. We're going to hit you with a number and that's going to be the number. Okay. But it's going to be big. Okay. What was the most you've ever gotten paid for a case overall? Have you ever had a million dollars from a client to get them out of something very serious, like an OJ type case? So, so the, you don't charge to get somebody out of it. You just charge. Um, right. But, but I'm, I, I can't really give you a number, but, um, but I would say it's a big number. <laughs> okay. And you've had lots of interesting nicknames. Uh, God in the streets, the witch doctor, the illest. Yeah. Am I missing any of them? You know, it, it, it never, uh, it never ceases to, uh, amaze me this, uh, you know, the whole, I, I don't even keep track of, of all of it. Um, and, uh, uh, probably one of the, the best conversations I've had is as many people know, the whole billion dollar lawyer thing started, uh, with Dolph, may he rest in peace. And so, uh, you know, Dolph does the video in LA and, and, and calls me the billion dollar lawyer. Well, uh, one of my favorite people that uh, the earth was ever blessed with was, uh, curse Nick ball, which is takeoff and takeoff. And I had to go to the uh, West coast during, um, COVID. And he was such a great kid. That was when everybody was so scared of COVID. He gets us a jet. So it's me and takeoff and one other guy that's just sitting away from us. He gets us a jet to go to the West Coast together. And we're about halfway through the flight talking about everything. Just great guy, we're having great conversations. Then he goes, Drew, you know it wasn't Dolph, right? I go, what are you talking about? He goes, no, nah, man. I've been, I was calling you a billion dollar lawyer long before then. So I don't know, Takeoff said he started it, but I heard it come from Dolph. I got no corroboration for Take, but I love both of those guys. Uh, but I get, I've heard all kinds of nicknames, but, um, Thank goodness they've all been good. Okay, so let's get to the YFN Lucci case. Sure. So I've interviewed Lucci a couple of times. Me and his manager have always been real close. And I actually interviewed him a couple of weeks before he got arrested. You know, nothing that we talked about had to do with his arrest, but it was really like kind of heartbreaking. Like, yo, I just sat down with this guy and you know we've had a good relationship and suddenly he's facing a bunch of really major charges. So coming into this case, explain exactly what he was facing. So what happened is, um, uh, 
as you know, in uh, December 9th, 2020, um, he was gifted a Maybach SUV. One day later, he was driving with that SUV um, with three gentlemen um, who were from Miami, um, a couple of who were aspiring to be uh, musicians as well, rappers. And uh, they drove through an area of town and a shootout ensued. And one of the people in his car, he was driving. Um, so the only thing that, uh, that Lucci, who's, who's Ray to us, we all call him Ray, Ray you know, uh, the only thing that he ever did was hold on to the steering wheel. But one of the guys in the back seat um, was shot and killed. And so the, uh, you know, we have a, there's a, a concept in the law, a doctrine in the law that we all learn in law school called the felony murder doctrine. And that felony murder doctrine says if you're perpetrating a felony and somebody dies as a result thereof, then it's felony murder, which is just like any other murder. And so immediately the accusation was like the people in your car that you were a party to and you were a party to that were committing aggravated assault at the time. And even though one of your buddies died, it was during the course of aggravated assault, it's felony murder. And so that one day later, which was December 10th of 2020, became a felony murder case. And so um, he had retained other counsel, but then approached me about, you know, working the case and taking the lead. Um, and uh, as time went on, that murder case became a RICO case. Uh, and so apparently there were other investigative efforts that had been taking place globally in the city of Atlanta during uh, a period of years. And they kind of swallowed up the December 10th incident and made it a RICO case um, with a total of 11 people incorporating all the events of December 10th. And uh, it was kind of a non-negotiable uh, case forever. I think you remember, um, I, was in, I was in trial in San Francisco for the entire month of October of this, this past October. And at some point we found out they were extending this offer that I know everybody reported, which was 17 years, including responsibility for that death, which would have meant that Lucci would have had to serve 85% of 17 years. Um, clearly, well, not clearly, but to me, I'm like, I would not advise you to take that. I would advise you to take the case to trial. 85% of 17 years is very, very um, tough for a young guy. And and so we maintained, as we did for that three-year period, that we were going to go to trial. And uh, away we went. And as you know, what happened? Okay, so let's talk about how this thing develops. So originally, it was just a shooting incident. It got extended to a RICO. So what exactly were they trying to say his role in the RICO was? Because the RICO is, you know, saying overall that he's part of a criminal organization and he's doing things in furtherance of this criminal organization. So what exactly were they trying to say in terms of what Lucci was charged with in the region? Yeah, they, they were trying to say that, that YFN um, was, uh, that he was part of YFN, which was associated with the Bloods. Um, and, they, and, and of course, you know, they were introducing music and serving us with, you know, music. And uh, as, I, as I told Lucci, I, I've listened to so much of his music not for any reason other than to try to figure out how there was some relationship uh, between him and Bloods because of, you know, red clothing. Uh, although this Sunday we're going to watch a Super Bowl where both teams are going to be clad in red, including, you know, 100,000 fans in red. So maybe from the government's perspective, we got two sects of the Bloods that are going to be playing one another for the Super Bowl because that's the way they nitpick about this whole red bullshit. Okay, so he gets arrested. He gets out on bond uh, on February 8, 2021. But then he ends up failing a drug test and he went to a strip club. So they basically violated his bond and put him back in, in jail on April 13th? Yeah, so, so let, me, let me tell you the way that went down. So at first, they, you're right. They listed all of these things that they say that he, um, that he violated and he was on a GPS monitor. And, uh, and so we ultimately um, kept on appealing, saying we wanted to appeal, appeal, appeal. And eventually the trial judge really extended it and we had this kind of long, robust hearing. 
And in this long, robust hearing, uh, we just destroyed all of the other allegations against him. All of the club stuff, all of the playing hanky-panky with the ankle monitor. We just destroyed, eviscerated, wiped out all of that. Um, and the judge ultimately writes an order and sets aside all those findings. And, it's, and essentially says, okay, Finling and other lawyers, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. But he failed two drug tests. Now, the problem with those two drug tests is, and probably, you know, the tons of people watching this will probably know because they may have had drug tests for, for jobs. You get these panel tests, but these were just field tests. So these weren't the kind of drug tests where you go into a lab, right? You're at your doctor's office, you give, you know, you pee in the cup. Um, these were field tests done by a, an officer that was part of the case that wasn't even trained to do them. And studies have shown, recent studies have shown um, that field tests are some of the leading reasons for wrongful convictions in the United States. But nevertheless, those two failed field tests were the basis for him sitting and waiting for trial for three years in the county jail. Well, right, because now he's back in jail and then right around March 3rd of 2022, he gets stabbed. Correct. What was the situation around that? Well, look, all I know is that, you know, the, the, the prosecution, um, you know, we, we continue to say we, we want nothing to do with YSL case, with nothing to do with it. Um, but we felt the prosecution was talking out of both sides of their mouth. On the one hand, they're calling him a victim, right? Saying he's a victim. And they're going to one courtroom and saying he's a victim and another courtroom saying he should get life without parole. Because remember, in Georgia, that felony murder case was an LWAP case, carried life without parole. And our position was consistently, you can't have it both ways. In fact, Georgia is what's called a Marcy's Law state. A Marcy's Law state means they need to be in contact with him being a victim. But nobody ever checked on Hay was doing. He never heard from the district attorney's office. He never heard from anybody to say, hey, Mr. Bennett, how you feeling, buddy? Understand you got attacked. Nobody ever addressed him. And of course, my, represent, my representation of him was, was so notorious, no one's called me one time. And so they kind of name dropped with him to say, wow, look at this other case we have where this famous guy is a victim. But we never heard word one from them, ever. And of course, we would constantly bring that up to the, to the court. And for a while, it didn't work. And ultimately, obviously, um, it didn't really matter. Well, yeah, I mean, he claimed that there was a bounty on his head. Was there any proof of that? I don't know anything about that. Okay. You know, and also the prosecutors said that Young Thug played a role in the stabbing and they were trying to kind of paint it as kind of a gang war in jail, essentially. Yeah, I, I, I've said consistently, I don't know anything about that and that Ray Bennett, Lucci, is not a witness to any case, is not gonna testify in any case. He's gonna get this case behind him, get out, be with his family, be with his children, and get his career going back to where it needs to be. You can try to drag him in a courtroom, he's just gonna not say a word. So you might as well put electrical tape over his mouth because he's not he has nothing to say to anybody. Well, right, because from what I understand, at one point, they wanted him to testify against Young Thug in the YSL case, and he refused. Now, did you guys have a conversation about this? And did you, I mean, were they offering him some sort of plea deal in exchange for his cooperation? There's, there's the only deal that you have seen is the deal that was publicly filed that he said no to, and how we ultimately resolve the case, um, which under Georgia parole guidelines makes him potentially eligible in now less than three months. Um, and other than that, that's that. Um, we've been very clear publicly, which was very important to Ray, um, that everybody be well aware of the fact that he's not testifying in any case. Um, and I think I've said before, you know, he wouldn't even testify in a traffic ticket. So he's not gonna testify in another courtroom. He wants to be as far from courtrooms as possible. He sat through over two weeks of jury selection. I know it's enough to burn out most people. Um, and, and he's one of them.
Do you find that common with clients that you represent when they simply just would not cooperate, sometimes to their own detriment? And a lot of times, I mean, in his case, we'll talk about that in a, in a second, it kind of worked out, but in a lot of cases, you don't cooperate you might end up doing 20 years over something you may not even have done yourself. Yeah. So, uh, look, a big part of our practice, Vlad, is federal practice. We have federal cases from coast to coast, border to border. We're all over America doing federal cases. Our federal system feeds on itself with cooperation. Um, and, uh, and you know, I, I, I know you did a, a stellar job with um, Sammy DeBull's interview. Um, and in many ways, a lot of us, right, think historically, is that where it all began? Um, and, you know, I mean, and, and the feds are uh, are addicted to cooperation. The, the system survives on, on cooperation, um, right? You know, those like little Russian dolls where one's on top of the other? That's cooperation. Mm -hmm. Every, you know, I say to people in, in federal holding facilities all the time when they get arrested, I go and see them. I go, hey, when you get back and you're eating at the cafeteria, look to your left, look to your right. Chances are they're both cooperating and no one says they're cooperating. And so what you're talking about is really unique to our federal system. And it, it is, you, when you don't cooperate in the federal system, I think you're a minority, um, but we're never gonna bend anybody's arm. We're not gonna break anybody's you know, arm to make them do that. Um, that's a real soul searching decision that folks have to make. So this year, it was finally announced that before the trial, he'd actually taken a plea deal. Tell me the details of this plea deal, because it was very, different than what I've ever heard before. Yeah, so let me be really clear, and this is one thing I wanted. It was not before trial. We were in the third week of trial. Ah, okay, my mistake. Yeah, and, and so um, we, had, we had teed it up. Uh, in December, before trial, there were 11 people in the case. Eight people pled out before trial. We did not, um, and uh, we said no to everything. And, uh, and so we began, the, the trial was projected to last, after jury selection, three months. Um, the court decided, given the length of the case and the number of witnesses, um, that they were gonna change it to Monday through Wednesday evidence, which obviously would have extended it well past three months but give jurors the opportunity to get to work, give the lawyers the opportunity. And so we probably, I think, would have gone five or six months. We were in our third week of jury selection when the case came to a sudden, dramatic end. Um, I can't really give you the behind the scenes, but I can tell you um, that we were stubborn from the very beginning on what was acceptable to us and what was not acceptable to us. And first and foremost was we wanted nothing to do with the death of Mr. Adams on December 10th of 2020 because we, it did not, it was, it, there was no responsibility in our opinion um, for Lucci and Lucci would never say that it had because he shouldn't have. And so we were pretty stubborn about that. These other folks, that pled out in December were pleading out to like 10, 11, 12 charges. And we said from the beginning, we're not, we're not doing that. We'll, we'll take one charge um, to get them out. Um, and you know, you'd have to study the nuances. There's no guarantees, by the way, but at least on the parole guidelines, um, if it's being associated, not a gang member, but associated, um, then it's kind of low on the, the guidelines. Um, and he'd already sat for three years. And so, um, the third of, of, of 10 years would, would be pretty, pretty good for him. And so all of a sudden at the end of the second week of jury selection, things started developing, um, at first at 20 miles an hour, and then eventually at 120 mile an hour pace. And on the, during the third week of jury selection. So going to your point earlier, we had just questioned 115 potential jurors, 115. Um, we still had another week and a half of jury selection. Um, but we were deep in the process. I mean, opening statements were ready, cross-examinations cross were prepared. I mean, we were in the game. Okay, so ultimately, what did he get and how much time is he gonna serve? Okay, so um, he pled to being an associate uh, in a gang-related charge and he got a 10-year 
sentence uh, with 10 years of probation. Um, and he under, because of the charge, because he did, because it wasn't um, the homicide charge, the homicide charge would have required an 85% of the 10 years. The RICO would have required substantial amount of the 10 years, but because of the charge that he pled to under the parole guidelines, he's eligible in one third of 10 years. So when you said, what makes this unusual? Here's the two things that makes it unusual. He's given credit for all time that he served, including the house arrest time. He was given credit for all of that, which was over three years. And the thing that that the judge commented on the record was the first thing he had seen in his career, which was significant to our resolution. We, again, there's no guarantees on parole, right? It's, it's a subjective analysis, but we wanted a letter from the district attorney's office that assuming over the next, because remember three and a half years was only gonna be three and a half months away. We wanted a letter from the district attorney saying that if during the next few months, Ray behaves himself, the district attorney's office has no objection and will agree to him being released at the first available date, which is a few months away. And they agreed to that letter. And the prosecutor made that part of the record to which the judge said, I've never even heard of this in my career. Um, but we insisted on that letter being on, on the record and going to the Georgia Board of Paroles. And that's the letter that has really shocked at everybody. Um, and so that's the deal. Okay, so he's getting out in three and a half months. And then hopefully, he'll hopefully have, that's, that, that's hopefully, the goal. Yeah. And then he'll have another 10 years of probation. So he has to finish out parole and then he'll have 10 years of probation. Um, but you, you have incentive dates um, and probation shouldn't last more than two or three years. Aha, got it, got it. Now, what's your take on the whole YSL Rico case, which is still ongoing right now? Well, look, um, you know, I know everybody involved in that case. Um, I'm, I'm really uh, shocked at the length. I'm shocked uh, at the process. Uh, if you were to compare our case to their case, there were some real differences. So if you remember, it took them like a year to get a jury. Mm -hmm. So when I got um, uh, involved in, in our case, uh, one of the things we were fortunate is the judge, and I appreciate it, kind of let me take the lead in some of my requests and really was, was listening. Um, and I didn't want to call out that case, but the problem with that case is they did, Vlad, what's called hardships first. So the first thing they did is they got into this pattern of asking people about their hardships. Oh, I got a, a wedding to go to. I have a vacation in Europe. I got this and that. And they just couldn't get momentum. And they were trying to do that before they even asked one qu other question to the jury potential jurors. Um, I told our judge, just make that part of the process. In other words, don't separate it out. Let's ask them about that and then go right into asking about who they are and all the other questions. And we had a questionnaire. They didn't do that there. And so we were going to probably pick a jury in a month where it took them a year. Um, I don't know why they did it that way. It makes no freaking sense. That's number one. Number two, the, the way they do these RICO cases with this template of these ridiculous uh, overt acts is bullshit, right? Um, and let me give you a good example. So I watched, um, I watched a good bit of one of your interviews and in and, and your Sammy the Bull interview, um, you talked about Pizza Connection trial, if you remember, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm, you know, no matter what, I, I'm, I'm more a student of my craft than I am of hip hop. Like I love the practice of law. I love the art of trying cases. I've studied the Pizza Connection case, read the book cover to cover, okay? And that was what was vogue back then, right? In the 80s, you know? The, the feds stopped doing that. The feds realized, what the fuck are we doing? What are we doing putting jurors in a hotel for a year and a half? What are we doing to our office, the staff, the courtroom personnel, the jurors? We're destroying everybody's life Okay, and we're making these cases so difficult on everybody. And the feds did a complete turnaround at the Department of Justice and started trimming down their cases. And by the way, winning cases left and right by consolidating them and just going for the gusto. All of a sudden, Fulton County District Attorney's Office, 
decides they're going to go 1980s and and do these ridiculous RICO cases with these little overt acts. I was talking to the lawyers in that case. They were proving a tw- one of the lawyers said they spent a full day doing a twenty dollar drug deal from like years ago. That's mm-hmm. bullshit. That's not going to get you a conviction. What it is going to do is it's going to cost the lawyers financially. And I feel for for my friends in that case, it's going to cost these jurors. It's going to throw off the district attorney's office and the courtroom personnel. And so I just think that case is a mess, to be quite honest. And and I think that Jeffrey may be the ultimate beneficiary of that mess, because when jurors get pissed, um, there's only one group that they punish, and that is the people that brought the case. Well, yeah, I mean, Fonnie Willis is the DA in this case, and she was the DA in the YFN Lucci case as well, right? Yeah, she's the elected DA, so she's at the top of the food chain. Right. And, I mean, the whole thing is is pretty messy. Uh, there's rumors that she had a romantic relationship with the guy Nut, who was kind of the murderer at the heart of that case. And, you know, the, they're saying that she's really overreaching in general. I mean, what's your take on Fonnie Willis? Well, um, I, I, I'm not going to, you know, kind of go into a personal thing with her. Uh, I'm just going to kind of generally talk about those cases and kind of go back to what I said to you I, I, a few minutes ago. I, I'm not quite sure why in the 50 states and the 11 federal dis, uh, circuits that Fulton County has decided that they need to prosecute cases like this. I think if they were students of the law, they'd realize that big time prosecutors, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to the ones that are doing this case, but the, you know, DOJ lawyers that did pizza connection to some of those cases, you know, those were, those were high end, you know, LA Laker prosecutors, New York Yankee prosecutors, and and they made a decision to do an about face, right? And all of a sudden these guys are going to come along in 2023 and decide we're going to go old school and just tie up a court for a year and a half. It's just bullshit. It's just bullshit. And I think they're ultimately may really pay the price with these 12 jurors. Well, I mean, besides the amount of resources, is there any inherent difference between a state RICO and a federal RICO? No, I mean, so Georgia just technically is a little bit more expansive. Um, and, and what they'll do is they'll tell you the story. It allows us to tell the full story. It's just, it's just stupid. Um, but it, it is, so what I say about RICO is, um, uh, I call RICO, if you've seen some of my interviews, I've called RICO the anabolic steroids of prosecutors right? It just makes a difficult uh, uh, at bat easier. Um, and it makes a difficult case easier. So what you do is through RICO cases, you create a, a year's worth of innuendo, rumor, tangential crap, and you see if you can squeeze a conviction out of it. Um, no different than you know, you're a mediocre 220 hitter that's capable of 15 home runs. You juice up and you're hitting 270 with 40 home runs. Same thing. Got it. Okay, and this brings us to you working with Trump. Now, Trump has a case, a RICO case in Georgia. And from what I always heard was the YSL case was almost like a a training ground for the Donald Trump case, which is what Fonnie Willis really wants. Now, before you had actually criticized Trump, when he had made comments about LeBron, you went on Twitter and you called him a racist, uh, you called him pathetic, and so forth. How did you end up actually becoming his lawyer? Um, so I'm going to kind of generalize in that discussion because you could see I've I've stayed clear of that for uh, for purposes. It's an ongoing case, and and I'm not going to interfere with it. Um, I'll just you know for consistency's sake, Vlad, say this: um, I'm a criminal defense lawyer's criminal defense lawyer. Um, I believe in this process, and um, I, I I I say long before that case. Um, that as criminal defense lawyers, to do this the right way, I don't believe in criminal defense lawyers that say like, oh, I don't do this kind of case. I don't do that kind of case. That, that's not the way I operate. Um, I, I, you know, when we take a case, you know, we, don't see, we don't see the color of your skin. We don't see your sexual orientation. We don't see um, your, uh, your gender, your ethnicity. And we certainly don't see um, your political leanings one way or the other. We just take a case. And so when I got approached on that case, um, you know, I'm pretty feel pretty firm in the fact that we are the best 
trial lawyers around anywhere, anywhere. Um, you know, we just went to the West Coast and, and beat the Department of Justice in a month long, very complicated white collar case. So we're just gonna take on a case. I have four aggressive, intelligent, ambitious, intellectual lawyers that love a good fight and are all liberals. Um, so when we have an opportunity to jump in a case, we jump in a case, regardless of who it is. And that's what we did there. Okay. Well, when you look at Trump's previous lawyers, it's there's some interesting stories behind him. Michael Cohen went to prison. Uh, Rudy Giuliani is charged with RICO himself, which is very ironic because this was like the guy that brought RICO and all the Italian mafia guys back in like the 70s and 80s. And I believe both of them have complained about not even getting paid by Trump at the end of the day. So coming into that, was that at all a concern? Yeah. One thing I never worry about is getting paid. And so I'm all good there. And of course, as you probably know, you can, it's all public record. You can find out every penny I've been paid. So that, that was never a concern of mine. Um, so that was, you know, anybody that candidly, I mean, not you, but most of the people in, in my world understood that's actually was a non-issue. Um, so getting paid was, was not an issue. Um, in terms of the Fulton County case, um, you, you made a point about five minutes ago that was a very astute, and that is that they're using the same template on all their cases. Uh, we anticipated they would use the same exact template. Uh, and so however it is that we came into the case, um, I think the perception was of some people, if you ultimately have to try the case and you want to win, this is the best law firm here or maybe anywhere in the United States to win the case. Um, and, and so we you know, were prepared. And as we just experienced with our endless motions in YFN, because if you look at YFN, we were filing briefs. Vlad, we were probably filing briefs through jury selection every other day. We never stopped writing. It's a big part of this profession. Um, so, you know, we were, we were cool uh, doing that, um, but you bring up a good point. The template's the same. I mean, hold up all three of the indictments. They all look the same. It's kind of insane. And I could tell by shaking your head, you know what I'm talking about. It's mm -hmm. kind of weird. And they're very different than the Jack Smith prosecution. That indictment is, is night and day. That's kind of succinct and to the point. And um, when I read that, again, you know, being a student of this profession, I hearken back to what I just mentioned to you like 30 minutes ago, the change in the DOJ from the old days um, to the way they do things now. Okay. And you said it's all public record in terms of how much you got paid. How much did Trump pay you to get your services? Man, you're just going to have to get on there up. and find okay. it. Okay. Hey, you can't blame me for asking. I, I love it though, man. I love it. Let me know if you're going to go to law school. Come on. We could be partners. <laughs> okay. And people have actually said I'd be a pretty good lawyer if I actually chose that I direction think so. at some point. But... Good questions. Okay. Well, but then last year, Trump ended up replacing you with Steve Sadow, who was actually Gunna's lawyer originally, right? Yeah. Yeah, me and him have had multiple conversations about it and everything else like this. So why did he end up leaving your law firm and going with Steve instead? Yeah, I'm not going to really go there. Um, uh, I know there are articles written about it. I know Rolling Stone wrote about it. And uh, I'll let the journalists um, do their explanation. Um, but we're all good. Uh, it was somewhat fortuitous uh, in many ways because uh, we picked up and moved to San Francisco for a pretty long time and we're entrenched in a complicated white collar case that was as far from hip hop as you can imagine. Um, but uh, it's all good. We're busy as can be. And I got five super happy lawyers right now. Okay. Well, can you say at least did you guys part ways or did Trump part ways? I, I just think we, we all parted ways. That's the best way of putting it. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, when you look at this case from a high level, do you think that he's going to be blocked from running for president? Or do you think that ultimately all this will fall aside? Because, for example, I interviewed Alan Dershowitz, who represented him, uh, I believe, during his, one of his impeachments while he was still president. And he predicted that all of this will, will fall apart. And ultimately, he's going to be able to run for president. And whether he agrees with him or not in terms of his politics, he still believes in representing people when it comes to the law. And he feels that all of this is trivial. What's your take on it? Well, I, I think that 
that you can't conflate the, all the cases in the analysis. So in order to do the analysis, you got to break it up into each individual case. Um, and, and so, and you have to break it up as a, you know, when all said and done, Vlad, I'm, I'm a trial lawyer and, and less than one hundredth of 1% of lawyers are actual trial lawyers. They all say they are, but like, that's literally, if you can't get me, it's because I'm in trial. Like, and so I'm looking at this through the lens of a trial lawyer. And so I don't care really what, you know, people say on TV and talking heads, because most talking heads are just unemployed lawyers. And, and so the documents case um, is, is just not going to get to trial because of the word documents. It's a documents case. A documents case, you know, we just tried a documents case and it took us, I don't know, two and a half years to get to trial. And, and so documents cases are just that. They are labor intensive. And you're talking about a documents case that you're going to have to prepare in a secure room. Um, if people aren't familiar with a secure room, that is laborious. That is a, a, a really challenging way to prepare. And so that case is just not going to go to trial fairly. Um, I don't care who the judge is. I don't care who appointed them. So take that one out. Real trial lawyers will tell you that's not going to go to trial. Um, the uh, federal case in D.C. has got some real complex legal issues. So I think the question is going to be, and we're seeing that right now, how time consuming will those legal issues be? And will they um, gobble up enough time the case can't go to trial? I don't have the answer to that. Um, but we see it's it's being reviewed as we speak in, in real time. And so that's just going to really go to whether or not um, that case is tied up in appellate review. And it's not improper appellate review. It's issues that do need to be handled. And then, of course, the Fulton County case is, um, as you can see, has become somewhat of a mess recently. And so that may be the ultimate monkey wrench, wrench in terms of the timeliness of that case. Well, right, because the DA, Fonnie Willis, she actually acknowledged that she had developed a personal relationship, a romantic relationship with Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade. Do you think that's going to ultimately derail the whole case or no? I, I don't know. I, I don't look at it as derailing the case. I think the question becomes who ultimately is going to prosecute that case. Mm. And that's the decision that's has, going to have to be made. If there's a change in the prosecution team, then the case, number one, who knows what happens to the case? It could go by the wayside because the next person may go, you know what? I'm not going to do this case. This case is being handled up in D.C. Or they may decide I'm only going to prosecute three of these people. Um, you don't know what's going to happen. I think what you do know if somebody new or new team comes in is no way it gets tried for a year and a half to two years. Aha. Uh -huh. Right. And I mean, Trump's other cases in terms of election interference that are happening in the states, that's actually being argued in the Supreme Court right now. It started yesterday, right? No, that was a, so that was a, a different, that was a different issue. No, I, yeah, no, I understand it's different, yeah. but it's somehow somewhat related to what's happening right now with Trump overall. I mean, ultimately, what do you think the Supreme Court will do based on your, you know, legal opinion? I, I think that um, that was uh, the decision about the ballot was a time sensitive decision. Um, if the Supreme Court's gonna take up any of the DC related issues, it just may not be a time sensitive issue. And so it may take them a while um, to, to, to really explore those issues, right? And, and look, it, it took them a while to indict that case. I mean, you know, they could have indicted it long before, but they didn't. And so you can't blame the appellate process because our appellate process is second to none uh, in the world. And so I don't think you're going to blame the appellate process. It just, the case got indicted after a good number of, uh, a good amount of time passed by. And so the appellate process may ultimately be what slows that case up and prevents it from going to trial. And as soon as some folks thought it was going to go to trial. Yeah, I mean, it's a crazy time right now. Clearly, Trump is the Republican you know, mainstay, no one's even close. So he's going to be running on the Republican ballot unless he is blocked from taking public office based on the whole, you know, capital attack situation. So, and he has a very, very good chance of beating Biden right now, considering everything that's happening. So it's, it's a very strange situation. 
in my whole lifetime, I've never seen anything even remotely like this. We're, we're at a moment in history, but Vlad, I feel like we've been saying we're at a moment in history so many times now. I'm just tired of saying we're at a moment in history. Well, that's what it is. Uh, Drew, I appreciate you coming in and uh, sharing your expert uh, you know, knowledge in this because when it comes to social media, everywhere, everyone's an armchair lawyer. Everyone knows exactly what should have happened. Everything is a conspiracy. Everything's a, you know, some sort of back end deal and so forth. So to actually talk to someone who's rolled their sleeves up and actually did this for a living and actually know all the details of it is very refreshing. I really appreciate you coming in. Absolutely, man. Wish you all the best. Until next time. Thanks, Vlad. Peace.